Hey, joining us at this time is a man who is no stranger to the Observer. He's Princess Town MP and UNC Shadow Minister of Public Utilities, Mr. Barry Patherat. A pleasant good evening, Barry. Good evening, Mikey, and good evening to your viewers. Thank you so much. Uh, well, a lot has been happening. I, I know you had your press conference today, and the spotlight has been on TSTT since this data breach took place uh, uh, on October the 9th, a cyber attack. And uh, although the telecommunications company was working, uh, according to reports, with cybersecurity experts on the matter, there seems to be still more questions than answers. Where were we at in all of this? Well, Mikey, um, you hit the nail on the head where you indicated that there are more questions than answers, that especially after the developments we've seen on all three front pages of the newspapers today with the axing or the sacking or the firing of Lisa Agard. And this in itself adds additional questions that need to be answered because Ms. Agard has now been thrown under the bus by TSTT by the Minister of Public Utilities and the government. Today, Dr. Murilal revealed in that press conference that the board of TSTT placed a gag order on the management and staff of TSTT prior to TSTT making any public statement with respect to the breach. Um, that gag order was further amplified by the board of TSTT mandating that there was to be no correspondence, no word, no communicating with the media or anyone on the outside um, unless the board had sanctioned such, unless the board had seen the correspondence and had agreed to the correspondence. So this throws a wrench into the entire situation as it relates to this data breach because someone must be held culpable. Someone must be responsible for over one million customers having their data essentially on the road. You know, in local parlance, we say your business is on the road. Well, over one million of TSTT's customers, their business is on the road, it's on the dark web. And the Minister of Public Utilities, in a very flippant, arrogant, and dismissive manner, came to the Parliament and lied to the country and said that there was no data breach. Days later, we are now being told that over one million customers' data is out there which includes your personal information, which includes banking information, but also one of the considerations that has not been um, made is also TSTT provides security service through Blink Vigilance, um, through Amplia, and what this does is that it stores the footage from your home, from your residence, from your business place, and criminals now have access to that sort of information. So it's not just your personal information as it relates to your data birth, your banking information, but also they know where you live, they know where your businesses are, they know how to get in, how to get out, what code to punch on, into the um, security system, etc. And therefore today, putting Lisa Agard at the front, as the minister and the government not taking responsibility, the prime minister has jetted off to Dubai and Saudi Arabia without addressing what is being described as the most treasonous attack on the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago in recent times. And, and, and I want to agree with you there. And, and, and again, if we go back to the minister's statement when this came into the public forum, he said that the TSTT board was putting things in place to conduct the investigation, and he, the minister, will be monitoring it and will ensure the resulting recommendations were implemented. Is it then the same board that came up with the um, idea that Lisa Agon has to go? Uh, I mean, himself investigating himself and saying, listen, uh, that individual there is the one that basically called the shot and has to go. Or is it just a matter of just giving us this to hold when in fact we are never going to get to the real genesis of what took place? Well, sadly, Mikey, Mikey, I believe it's the latter, because this government has a history of treating with serious matters like this, when the egg is on their face, to move on to the next big thing or create some sort of distraction. The board must take responsibility. If we are to believe that if Lisa Agard misled the minister, if Lisa Agard was responsible for the communications going wrong, 
with respect to this particular matter. The board must also take responsibility, and the minister must take responsibility, because it's the minister's onus to ensure that whatever information is being put out there, that he is guided by the board. Let us not separate the board and the minister from the management of TSCT. We've seen that the minister has taken this very approach to trying to separate himself and the board from WASA and TNTX. And today, literally, when egg is on their face, with respect to this particular issue, the minister and the board will have us believe that they are separate and apart from the decision-making of the management of TSCT. How does this work? The government through the cabinet appoints the commissioners that sit on the board of TSCT. The government, who is the majority shareholder of TSCT, determines who is the chairman of the board of TSCT. They determine who is the vice chairman. They, de they determine who sits on the management structure and what the management structure entails at TSCT. So is it that the, the minister once more is telling us that his hands uh, are clean and that he is totally absolved from the situation? It cannot be. It cannot be because simply the minister has a responsibility and that responsibility is the board members that he has placed at TSCT acting on behalf of the Republic of the Government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. It is the cabinet and the government that determines what government policy is. And I therefore when this matter arose and there was a cyber attack and a breach of security at TSCT, what kicks in is government's policy. And what is government's policy to deal and treat with these matters? And that really is the crux of the situation. And, 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 and you, the, and opposition, the opposition is simply not accepting throwing Lisa Agard under the bus. That is just one element. And Lisa Agard has a history with this government. First, she served as the vice president of legal years ago. Then she became the chairman of CNMG, which is a politically appointed position by this sitting PNM administration in 2017. She then went, uh, went over to Amplia when Massey in 2017 and asked the Minister of Finance and the Prime Minister about the acquisition of Massey Communications at the tune of $280 million. While Lisa Agard was in the middle of these negotiations, the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance got up and said they knew nothing about this. A $280 million acquisition by TSPT, and they knew nothing about nothing it. Nothing about it. it so they have placed trust, faith, and confidence as once a political appointee at CNMG, and then continuing to promote her both in the public uh, and private sector. And uh, today, they're trying to remove themselves completely, and, and, completely from any connection to and, the state. You're correct with that point. And again, it goes back again to the line minister. And you're correct. I mean, you, you definitely cannot separate the, the individuals here. The minister, the line minister said to us, the citizens of this country, the general public, he said the public had the right to know what happened and what should be done to protect citizens' data in the future, as anyone could be a potential victim of the cyber attack. Since TSTT was a repository of data on thousands of citizens and residents. Now, good and well, Lisa Agard is gone. Uh, I mean, basically, we can say poor corporate governance. But again, what has been investigated? What has been revealed? What has been unveiled? Is it how many conversations did they have with the line minister? Was it just Lisa Agard? Were there other members of the board? Who, t who said, listen, it's in the public domain. Should we acknowledge it? Should we ignore it? Should we just simply try to sweep it under the rug? And you're right, giving up Lisa Agard at this point in time is very premature, seeing that we the citizens are still waiting to find out just exactly where our data has gone, who has it, how they're using it, and how are we going to pay a price for it sometime in the near future when in fact our own economic currency, our economic status could be, of course, uh, muddied. It, it, Going to do a transaction, and you told Mr. Paradise, but you have another mortgage in such and such place, or you have another credit card. Unknowing to you, somebody has been using it. At the end of the day, this is just cosmetic. How do we get down to the core issue here of how it happened, how it was dealt with, and how it's not going to be repeated? Well, Mikey, I suspect that the government is hoping that all the noise that has been surrounding this particular issue, that now that they have thrown the blame on one person, that that noise will subside. I can assure the national community and 
the government and the noise will not subside. We in the opposition, have, we intend on filing a freedom of information, but also we intend on raising this matter in the parliament in terms of bringing a matter of a motion of privilege against the minister for lying to the country and misleading the parliament of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. But let's take it a step further, separate and apart from that. We have called for the board, the board must go. They must take responsibility. The minister must go. And we are going to use the ambits that are available to us inside and outside of the parliament to ventilate this issue. But what, where do we go forward from here? Where do we go forward from here in terms of the investigation? The minister has admitted that almost two weeks has passed since we are told that our data is on the, the, the dark web. Um, after that being told one day it, there's no data breach, next day there's a data breach. Left hand don't know what the right hand is doing. They don't know if they're going or coming. Today, up to today, we are being told that no investigator has been appointed. We have placed in the public domain earlier today that the Trinidad and Tobago Police Service has remained very quiet, very silent on this particular issue. And the only authority that really should be dealing with this in terms of an independent probe must be the Office of the Commissioner of Police. Because this, as I said earlier, this separate and apart from 1990, it's probably the most memorable in our nation's history in terms of the most treasonous attack on our nation and our republic. But Mikey, let us take that a step further. With the TTPS remaining silent on this matter, we not knowing after two weeks who the investigator is, is but also knowing that no investigation has commenced, this is a situation of blind leading the blind. And therefore, we intend on writing the Commissioner of Police to find out whether or not an investigation has been launched because the Minister has admitted that, as far as he knows, that there is no um, investigator being appointed. But, my dear, I want to, 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 to throw your mind onto something else, which I've been asking um, rhetorically. Who is next? We have seen this happen at the Attorney General's office. We've seen it happening at TSTT. We've seen, ha seen it happen at the SWRHE. Trinidad and Tobago is a hydrocarbon-driven industry. We have seen right across the water, seven miles from us in Venezuela, when they have massive blackouts and so on, which have been orchestrated by um, groups who engage in these cyber attacks, etc. We have seen several countries around the world being crippled through their public utilities sector, but also through their hydrocarbon sector. We provide hydrocarbon to many countries, be it in North America, be it in South America, be it in Europe. Should these cyber attacks hit National Gas Company? Should it hit Paria Fuel Trading? Should it hit TNTEC? What is going to be the position of the people of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago being held to ransom? Just about four or five years ago, in 2017, the government established a joint select committee on cybercrime. There is international benchmarks and international legislation that deals with specific incidents of cyber attacks, such as the one where we have experienced at TSTT. In 2017, when the government commissioned that joint select committee, in 2019, a final report was sent back to the House of Representatives. It requires the opposition through a, a two-thirds majority vote to support that legislation. The government allowed the bill in Parliament to lapse, meaning that they never brought it for it to be debated, despite having reached so far with a final report from the Joint Select Committee. We thought that, well, in the next general election of 2020, that they would have brought it back, seeing that Trinidad and Tobago is in one of those environments that is constantly um, being focused on for these cyber attacks because of the nature of our society being right. a hydrocarbon driven industry, etc. 2020, 21, 22, 23, we are at the end of 23, almost four years later, that Joint Select Committee has been disbanded, no legislation has been brought, no bill has been brought to the last parliament, the 12th or the 13th parliament, and today, Trinidad and Tobago remains vulnerable because the government has sat on their hands and have done absolutely nothing. No, let, 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 me, let me just say something here, Mr. Parra. And going back to a point that you made earlier, and you, you're quite right, you spoke about the, um, the Office of the Commissioner of Police and the TTPS, because the Prime Minister made it quite clear on a Facebook post after the incident that citizens' data falling into the hands of criminals was disturbing. And he called on TSTT to treat the matter with the greatest competence 
and utmost sincerity. He said TSTT is also expected to treat this matter as a national security threat and ensure that the public trust is restored, preserved, and handled with absolute professionalism. Who is the head of the National Security Council? Well, Michael, let me ask you it this way. Who is TSTT? Because the Prime Minister in that public post, again, is attempting to separate the government from TSTT. The Prime Minister, in the first instance, should have taken the bull by its horns. As I told you before, TSTT, majority shareholder, is the government of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. We own 51% of TSTT. And therefore, the Prime Minister cannot separate himself. The Prime Minister should have taken leadership on this issue. The Prime Minister jetted off to, to, to Saudi Arabia without out addressing the national community, without calling in the National Security Council, without calling in all the players, the board members that his government appointed at TSTT, that his Minister of Public Utilities is responsible for none of that occurred. Instead, the Prime Minister penned a, a Facebook post saying that TSTT must do this, that, and the other. But we have to ask ourselves, who is TSTT? TSTT is the government. The TSTT is the state. And who is the state and who is the government? It is the Prime Minister and the Cabinet of the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. But this is a lazy Prime Minister. This is a Prime Minister who continues to pass the buck and place blame everywhere else rather than taking the bull by its horns and saying this is a, a serious issue. This is almost treasonous. And therefore, if we continue to see this sort of pattern developing in terms of attacks on other state enterprises or also um, the private sector, this is a serious cause for concern. Because this is not only going to cripple industries in the financial sector, it can also cripple industries that we are totally dependent on in terms of revenue generation through the hydrocarbon sector and through downstream industries. And, and you're right and, about that. You're right. I mean, and the Prime Minister could not, could not care one hoot about that. The Prime Minister yeah. jumped on a plane and he left. And you're right. And, and, and to make a statement saying that this should be treated as a matter of national security, I mean, you had cyber attacks that affected economies. It affected more than 200,000 computers across more than 100 uh, countries, and it costed an estimated $8 billion in four days. And that's coming out from the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Now, we can't take such a hit. I, I can't believe we can take such an economic hit, especially in this current global season that we're experiencing. So again, it's verbal acrobatics that we are witnessing here is not helping the cause. Because as you said, we could basically have our economy shut down by a group of individuals who will be holding us to ransom and will simply be sitting ducks. Yes. Well, Mikey, again, I, I think you contextualized the situation. You said um, verbal acrobatics, but coupled with the verbal acrobatics is the government is looking for a scapegoat. And instead of dealing and treating with this situation frontally, you know, I've been looking over the past day or two in terms of what are the international benchmarks that governments look at in terms of finding solutions, at least in terms of beefing up the security and putting apparatus in place to treat with these matters. First and foremost, when you look at the Budapest Convention, which many countries around the world have signed on to, that Budapest Convention tells you specifically what are the measures that you need to put in place. They call for strategic planning in terms of a recovery plan. Almost two weeks has passed and they, we have heard nothing about a recovery plan in terms of what is the government's position on what we are doing to stymie these, these cyber attacks. We are also being told as part of the Budapest Convention that many countries have signed on to, as I've told you, the issue of creating a national response and data center. The closest thing that we have to that is the Strategic Services Agency, as Dr. Mulan told us earlier today, that Strategic Services Agency has received two, almost half a billion dollars in funding in the past two years. And all they do is macro political opponents, and they do not fulfill the mandate of providing intelligence and so on. They too seem to be the dark, even though they are, they are the body responsible for this. And the third ambit was the implementation of domestic legislation in tandem with the Budapest Convention in terms of telling us what are the reporting mechanisms, what needs to be done, which area needs to be strengthened, and so on. None uh, uh, of that has found itself in yeah. the public domain. You ask yourself, for the past two weeks, 
this country has been under this attack, and which minister of government has come out and articulated and said, this is what we need to do, this is what other countries are doing, and this is what we can do in order to stymie and prevent further attacks. Now, we understand that these things will happen from time to time. It is not a, a foolproof situation. Of course. But the government cannot sit down on their hands and continue to do nothing like they have done with every other sector in this country. I, when you think about health, education, national security, they have done nothing. And I agree with you. You, are, you have pretty much put the business sector, you have put the industrial sector, and you have put every man and woman on the street who uses a cellular network with data, their business is out there on the road, and therefore they are susceptible not only to their businesses being attacked, but their homes being invaded, and their personal data and identity being stolen. Yep. And the government has not a word to say about that. Instead, they are focused on Lisa Agard when they should have come out and told the country, listen, we take responsibility for the way in which this was handled. This is what we are going to do to protect you and protect your data. I want to point out one other thing to you, Mikey. There's something called the Data Protection Act that the People's Partnership passed in 2011 under Mrs. Pasad Bicester. In order to operationalize that to protect people's data, we needed to put the hardware and the software in place. And by 2015, we were almost completed with putting that in place. When this government came in, they did not operationalize the Data Protection Act. What they did was they cherry-picked which part of the Data Protection Act they wanted to implement, and I'll tell you why. It had to do with the property tax, so that they can use your information, from your personal information, from one ministry or one state enterprise to the other. And that was the only part of the Data Protection Act that they proclaimed. Today, January 2023, Senator Mark brought a motion to the Parliament uh -huh. calling for the proclamation of the entire thing so it protects you as a citizen in terms of your information, your passport, your ID card, your driver's permit, your banking information, your credit card, for all of that to be protected. That you have some sort of recourse, you have some sort of redress if something like what occurred with TSCT is to happen. And, and, right? and let me ask you, uh, again, going back, to, and again, we're witnessing some verbal acrobatics here once again. We've got about six or seven weeks before we usher in a brand new year, and yeah. the Public Utilities Minister is saying it is very unlikely that electricity rates will be increased this year. Mikey, as I've said earlier today at the press conference, that is a case of semantics. Semantics and political posturing. The government knows that they are on, its, on the ropes. They know that the people are saturated and they are, they are totally fed up. The government has given the assurance, and it's in the black and white, if you look at page two of the Moody's report in July 10th of 2023, where the Minister of Finance met with Moody's and assured them that new electricity and water rates will be in effect. Um, and therefore, the Moody's rating was determined in terms of Trinidad and Tobago's credit rating was determined by the assurances that the Minister gave to Moody's. And therefore, it is government's policy that this um, financial year we will see these increases in water and electricity. I think what is happening now is a little bit more than the verbal acrobatics. It seems that they're doing a bit of political acrobatics now because they are very well mindful of the results of the local government election. All right. They lost serious ground. They are very unpopular with the decisions and the management that right. um, style that they have adopted over the past. It, it's, it's also Christmas. Correct. And during this Christmas season, I think citizens will feel it the most in terms of the harsh, stiff measures that government has taken that has been anti-people. Um, and that is what this administration has been known for. So it is a way of softening the ground in preparation for all that is to come for a uh, general election. But I think Trinidad and Tobago has widened up this government. I don't think they believe much more of what comes out of the mouth of the Prime Minister, far less for the Minister of Finance. And therefore, I don't believe that any right-thinking citizen in this country believes that they will not be paying higher water and electricity tax within the um, rate within this financially coming. Yeah, yeah, but I think in order to appease the general public that talk about back pay, which of course is not back pay, it basically does uh, belong, it, it deservedly right to these uh, workers. But this talk about back pay, going back to the old days where uh, ensuring that there's a ham or a chicken in every oven. But the reality of that is with about six or five weeks to go, again, before we usher in 2024, the reality is property tax. 
the increase in electricity rates, what's going to happen with WASA, what's going to happen with food prices, uh, and all of these things when you start making a list and going down. Uh, and, and basically, time is running out. Uh, the middle class has been wiped out, according to economists here in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, what, what used to pass as middle class is no longer. There seems to be no, no middle, no buffer zone. It's either you have or you don't, and who live, live, and who die, die. And I keep asking everyone on the Observer, where do we go from here? Mikey, you have just stated several things that this country can expect going forward. And I constantly ask myself, um, for people who live day to day, you know, persons who sell in the market, who work in supermarkets, little stores, who have a rent to pay with a salary of $3,000 and your rent is 2500 they have children to send to school, they have food and, uh, and, and medical bills to pay for. I constantly ask myself, how do people in this country survive on these meager earnings um, against the backdrop of high levels of um, food inflation in particular, but high cost of living? Uh, things are, you know, in local parlance, we say things are getting bad. I've constantly been saying Trinidadians need to stop saying things are getting bad. Things are damn bad. It is bad, 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 and it's a reality that we must confront. But where do we go from here? And it is the responsibility of every citizen in this country to... Go after some self-introspection um, and self-realization, determining whether or not the politics, the divisive politics of race baiting, of, of, of staying north and south of the colony, whether or not that mindset is going to take you anywhere further in 2024, 20, 2025. And therefore, we must start making conscious decisions as a country and as a people and do what is in the interest of our homes, and do what is in the interest of our pockets. Yeah. We have seen where time and time again this government has demonstrated that they are not interested in the poor man. The Prime Minister has said that the rich must get richer, and therefore that is where the government's policies have been best placed, according to him. And therefore it is the responsibility of those of us who are against this government and against these harsh and oppressive measures to come up with a viable alternative um, in terms of putting together the team and Mrs. Fasad Bissessa is able, ready, and willing. She has been assembling the troops at the borders. We have been articulating what our vision and what our policy is. But the country must want betterment for themselves. I always say is that no one can want something more than you want it for yourself. And therefore, you as a responsible citizen who's facing these daily challenges, um, being under attack by a wicked and callous government, you must want that better quality of life for yourself. And I think that is the very first step in terms of getting to where we need to be. So I would say to Trinidad and Tobago, if you haven't woken up as yet, you need to start getting there. Because if you think things are bad now, wait until your pockets are picked to pay those high electricity and water rates when more job losses are to come and when crime reaches your doorstep. Yeah. Because that is the reality that many of us are facing outside there. Thank you so much for linking with us here this evening. It's been a pleasure. And I do wish you all the best for the upcoming season and the best of luck into 2024 and beyond.